Um, um, I want to appreciate the, the leadership of this ministry. Um, my beloved brother, Bakorede, thank you so much for having me. And all the organizers, the executives, thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. And I pray that the Lord will speak to us in the name of Jesus. Um, tonight, as we have known the topic to be fresh fire, we trust that the Lord will open our eyes to see what we need to know on this concept in the name of Jesus. Now, please take note of this. Um, you can't talk of fresh fire when you don't have an altar. You can't talk of fresh fire when you don't have an altar. If fire will burn, then it will burn on your altar. So, you must have an altar before you desire fresh fire. Take note of that. The condition of your altar will define the condition of your fire. The condition of your altar is what defines the condition of your fire. So, fresh fire can only come from a fresh altar. A fresh fire can only come from a fresh altar. Now, the word fresh here is not talking about something new. Freshness here speaks of consistency. Freshness here speaks of consistency. Your altar can't be fresh if you are not consistently sacrificing on it. So what makes your altar fresh is your consistency in ensuring that you bring sacrifice to the altar. Are you getting what I'm saying? Now, you must also note that every altar is God's way of meeting the needs of the people. So if you have an altar, it becomes easy for God to use you as a tool to meet the needs of others. It becomes easy for God to use you as a tool to bless others. You can't be a true blessing if you don't have a true altar. If your altar is not real, you are fake. You see, who you are is reflected on your altar. If you want to know who a man is, check his altar. His real face is on his altar. Either his real identity is on his altar. So if your altar is cold, you are not hot. If you tell us you are hot, then you are lying. If your altar is cold, you are cold. If your altar is hot, you are hot. Please take note of that. The freshness here is in the weight of the sacrifice and how often you sacrifice on the altar. So, freshness speaks of two things. One, what I mean by freshness, I, I, I mean what makes your altar fresh? Two things. The first one is the weight of the sacrifice that you offer on it. And number two is the, the, how, how often you bring the sacrifice. Because even when you, you sacrifice something and has, that has weight on your altar, if you don't bring that thing consistently, your altar may not be fresh. And if your altar is not fresh, then your fire cannot be fresh. Are you getting what I'm saying? So, fresh altar, fresh fire. No altar, no fire. If your altar is fresh, your fire will be fresh. If you don't have altar, you have no fire. Take note of that. What is an altar? An altar is not a place. In the olden days, that is before Jesus came, it was a place. So you see the priest going to the Holy of Holies, you know, doing some sacrifice, killing animals. That's in the olden days. But now, the altar, now that Jesus has come to die, the equation has changed. Your altar now is in your consecration. If you don't have a consecration, then you don't have an altar. Take note of that. It is possible for a person to have several altars if his consecration is more than one. It's possible for a man to have several altars if his consecration is more than one. For instance, if you are a type that reads the Bible every day, you will have an altar in that, you know, you will have an altar in that consecration. And that altar will be fresh as long as you continue to read the Bible on a daily basis. Are you there? So inside every consecration, there is an altar. Take note of that. Consecration is what creates an altar. And the same consecration is what keeps an altar. So if you want to create an altar, you need consecration. And if you must keep that altar, you also need consecration. So what you did to get something spiritual is what you will also continue to do to keep that thing. That's the rule. Now, there are 
other examples of altars. For, this, for example, you have prayer altars. Are you there? Prayer altar is this altar that you need to keep by consistent prayer. So to keep a prayer altar, you need to be consistent in praying. We also have altar of excellence. Are you there? Now, what you need to keep your altar of excellence is diligence. This is what provokes an excellent spirit. Excellent spirit does not respond to your confession. Oh Lord, give me an excellent spirit. You want to be 10 times better, yet you are 10, 10 kilometers far away from seriousness. It will not happen. Are you there? But when an excellent spirit sees diligence, it becomes easy for that spirit to possess you. Excellent spirit is attracted to diligence. Excellent spirit is, is attached to diligence. So a man that is not diligent in what he's doing cannot get an excellent spirit even when he prays for it. Because God is principled. So he will not break his rules because of you. Are you getting what I'm saying? It, God, you see, God is love, but love is not stupid. So God, in his display of love, will not reduce his standards. He will not break his principles because of you. For instance, though Jesus has come to die, but for you to enter into his labor, you have to believe. But God will not say because uh, there are too many sinners, okay, you don't have to believe again, just come. No, you have to believe to become. You have to believe to become. So it's your believing that brings you into becoming. Becoming what? A son of God. The Bible says as many of those that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Take note of that. And we also have altar of mysteries. Altar of mysteries. Now, to keep altar of mysteries, then you must engage in meditation. You must engage in meditation. Are you there? We also have altar of inspiration. To keep out of inspiration, you must also engage in meditation. So both mysteries and inspiration respond to meditation. So a man that knows how to meditate, we access the mysteries of God. Because while he's thinking on the scriptures, light will come. And that light is mysteries being unveiled to him. While he's thinking on the scripture, inspiration will come. He begins to have something to write. If he's a singer, now he has a song to sing by the virtue of meditation. So to keep the altar of mysteries and inspiration alive, you must be addicted to meditation. What is meditation? Meditation is a rehearsal of the word of the Lord in your spirit. Meditation is a repetition of God's word in your spirit. Are you getting what I'm saying? You are thinking the scriptures. And don't forget, when you are thinking the scriptures, you are thinking the thoughts of God. So, now, meditation now brings you to that point where you, your thoughts align with the thought of God. That's the point where your will becomes the will of God. Me, by meditation. That's the power of meditation. Where your altar is, is where your strength is. Where your altar is, is where your strength is. So, where you don't have an altar, is where you don't have strength. Take note of that. What is an altar? Your altar is your consecration. Where is your altar? Your altar is in your consecration. What is an altar? Your altar is your consecration. Where is an altar? An altar is in consecration. I know you are surprised. Leviticus chapter 1, verse 7 to 8. If you read that place, you discover that only priests can access altars. Only priests can access altars. Not anybody can go to altars. Only priests can access altars. Are you getting what I'm saying? So, they are the ones that can sacrifice on the altars. If you are not a priest, don't approach the altar. Don't move near because you can be consumed. There were people in the scripture that died because they were trespassing. They did what only the priest should do. The question is, if you have an altar, then who will be the priest on that altar? The one that created the altar by consecration is the priest of the altar. This is why the Bible says that you are kings and priests. Do you know why the Bible called us priests? He, he called us priests because he expected us to create an altar by consecration. That's all. This is not a matter of confession. It's not about, I'm a priest, I'm a priest, I'm a royal. Mm -mm. Priesthood is resting on altars you become a priest when you have an altar 
But without an altar, you are not a priest. Without an altar, you are a prey. Are you getting what I'm saying? You are a prey to predators. Priesthood does not respond to confession. It responds to consecration. Priesthood does not respond to confession. It responds to consecration. If you are not a priest, then you are a prey that is vulnerable to predators. When you have an altar, you become the predator and your enemies become the prey. But when you have no altar, then you become the prey and your enemies become the predators. The choice is all yours. So you choose which one you want. Leviticus chapter 1 verse 12. If you read that place, you will discover that it is not enough to have sacrifice. You have to lay the sacrifice on the wood in an orderly way so that your fire will not go out. Note this. The altar. Number one, the altar. Number two, your fire. Number three, the wood. Number four, your sacrifice. And number five, the sacrifice. I'm going to explain this to you. Take note of it. I'm going to repeat it again so that you can note it. Number one, the altar. Number two, your fire. Number three, the wood. Number four, your sacrifice. Number five, the sacrifice. Now, the first one, the altar. You see, when you successfully create an altar by consecration, the moment this altar gains acceptance from the Lord, then it becomes his altar. That means God takes over the altar from you. He takes charge. Though you created it, but now it has become God's altar because it is accepted. An acceptable altar becomes the Lord's. It becomes God's altar. Are you there? Therefore, the altar of God in your life is that acceptable altar you have created by consecration. Are you getting what I'm saying? Number two, your fire. This is what you gain by erecting an altar. The moment God takes over your altar and it becomes his altar, what he gives to you in return is fire. Are you, are you noting that? When God takes over your altar, what he gives to you in return is fire. It is this fire that you now call your fire. When you see someone that carries or someone that has fire, then you must know the origin. It is not about shouting, Lord, give me fire. No. When your altar is acceptable, it gives you fire in return. Are you there? Since he has already taken your fire, you know, since he has already taken your altar, he won't leave you stranded. So in order to reward you for your altar that he has taken, he gives you fire. So the fire you carry is a proof that a certain altar that you have created by consecration has been taken over by the Lord. The fire that you carry is a proof that a certain altar that you have created by consecration has been taken over by the Lord. Fire is more of reward than something you get just by asking. Are you there? You can get a gift by asking. But for reward, only labor will qualify you for it. Ask for gift, but labor for reward. Ask for gift, but labor for reward. If you dip your hands into the fire, you don't need to pray and say, Lord, let my hands be burned. No, because you have dipped your hands into the fire, your hands will be burnt. Now, that burning is a reward for that action. For example, you see, there's a difference between gift and reward. Gift is something that you get without doing anything. You did not do anything to deserve it. The person just gave it to you by his will. For instance, you know, for example, salvation is the gift of God. We were not the one that died. We have not seen Jesus physically. If you have seen Jesus, I'm sure it's by revelation. But yet we could access salvation because it's a gift. If you take a bike and then um, after dropping, you, you give the bike man money. That money you have given to that man is not a gift. That money is a reward because you are rewarding the man for taking you to your destination. If you are working in a place and at the end of the month, you are given a salary. That salary you are receiving is not a gift. It's a reward because you have worked for it. And you get what I'm saying. So gift is not the same 
as reward. Number three, the wood. The wood. Now that your fire, you know, now that you have fire, I mean, now that you have fire, you must now begin to put wood on it so that you can keep it burning. The wood here is primarily the word of the Lord. The wood that you will put in your fire is the word of the Lord. When this word, which is the wood, is reaching you, then you can now pray because without having the word, you'll be praying amiss. That's, that, that's the truth. Without having the word of the Lord, you will pray amiss because the word of the Lord must serve as the basis, the foundation for all that you do. Fasting can also help you. Can also help you to fuel your fire. Number four, your sacrifice. Your sacrifice. Now, your sacrifice here is the effort you make to ensure that your fire keeps burning. Any effort you make to ensure that your fire keeps burning is your sacrifice. Examples, you know, are you know going to fellowship. Are you there? It's, it's, it's part of it. Engaging in personal study of the word of God, praying without ceasing, fasting, giving to promote kingdom advancement, speaking well of others, winning souls for the Lord, helping others with what you have, submitting to discipleship or mentorship, working for God, inviting people to Christian gatherings, publicizing Christian materials. It can be messages, books, and so on. Correcting in love, submitting to authorities, communicating with the language of honor. All these things are examples of sacrifice. Number five. Now, take note, I've explained your sacrifice. Now, I want to explain the sacrifice. There's a difference between your sacrifice and the sacrifice. Now, the sacrifice now are the people that you want to help. They are the people that you want to make strong in the Lord. As a brother, if you want to help a sister, are you there? And this sister is always seducing you each time you come close to her. It is better to cut off because mentorship and discipleship is not by force. Those people you want to help to know God are the meat. And for you to help them, you have to put them on your fire. Because they are raw. So the reason you are putting the meat on your fire, on, on your fire is so that you can bring them from their raw state to their cooked state. To their cooked state. Are you getting what I'm saying? That state where they will be ready for the master's use. Because you can't eat a raw meat. You have to cook it. And for you to cook the meat, you need to bring the meat on the fire. So those people you are trying to mentor, bring, you know, those people you are trying to bring up in the will of the Lord are the meat that you want to put on your fire. But you must understand according to the scripture that there's a way you put the meat on your fire. If you put the meat on your fire carelessly, your fire will go out. That's it. You want to help a sister, she's always seducing you, and you are still there trying to win the, the sister. She will end up winning you into corruption. And at that point, your fire will go out. This is why many people in their attempt to go after the lost, they also became lost. They became missing. Are you getting what I'm saying? You have to understand this. Set boundaries. That's how to orderly put um, the, the, the fire. I, I, the, how to orderly put the wood now. How to successfully put the meat on your fire without putting out your fire is by setting boundaries. Are you there? As a Christian sister, you must set boundaries around yourself. Otherwise, the brothers you are trying to help to grow will bring you into sin because you don't have boundaries. The orderliness around your fire is the boundaries that you have set for yourself. Don't collect things from brothers anyhow. Collect this, collect that. Before you know it, you, you find yourself in trouble. And as a brother too, set boundaries so that you will be able to help people without being in trouble. Take note of that. If you don't have an altar, don't try to wage war against dark altars because you may end up being slaughtered. For instance, if by revelation you discover that um, there's an altar in your family, there's one dark altar in your family, if you lack wisdom, you may begin to wage war. Before you wage war against an altar, you need to check, do you have an altar? Because only altars can fight altars. Are you there? So it is when you have altars, that's when you can fight demonic altars. It is altar to altar. The battle now is altar to altar. So when you have altars, 
and your altar is on fire, then you can wage war against demonic altars. And what will be fighting against those altars is your own altar. Your altar will serve as back backup for you. Are you getting what I'm saying? I pray the Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. Once again, thank you so much for having me. God bless you.